What is up, everybody? Welcome on Inside, yet another edition of the Business and Social Podcast, powered by SCN Digital. I'm your host, David Brickley, as always, joined by producer Will Kelly. Producer Will, episode number 76. We are itching ever so closer to number 100. What are we going to do for 100? We start, we start thinking about that now. I mean, do we have to do the 100 tips that we learned in the 100 episodes? Do we uh, throw yeah, a party? Do we... Um, that, I know that like, adds more work to producer Will's play. It's a, it's a, it's a big rag task. I, I think like uh, AAU leagues, they let you wear like three digit numbers. So maybe we just do that. I have to find some uh, some workarounds there. Let's make sure we uh, we think about what, what yeah. we're doing for yeah, 24 episodes to figure that out. Yeah, let's. Uh, there's no excuse to not have an amazing plan for 100. All right, so episode number 76. Before we introduce our guests and who we're talking to today, let's uh, let's break it down. I guess ages here. At yeah, we're gonna jump back to age. I'll go through these pretty quick. Uh, Eric Clapton. Steve Martin, Danny DeVito, Tom Selleck, Priscilla Presley, Helen Mirren, uh, Rod Stewart, Vince McMahon, <laughs> and let's do one more here. Uh, Henry Winkler. Oh, and Van Morrison. I mean, who's not who's not a big fan of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia? So we got to go with the Danny DeVito podcast, right? I Most mean, underrated comedy of all time. One of the best actors, I think, of all time, too. I mean, the guy's incredible. All right. So the Danny DeVito podcast, we are going to be joined by Ben Gallagher. He is the chief operating officer over at Full Squad Gaming. A lot of you may be familiar with NRG Sports. But Ben has a great, um, a great resume. I mean, he was a consultant for Nike. He moved on to help start the check down at the NFL. And then he moved to House of Highlights. Uh, which is interesting, right? He he started at Bleacher slash House of Highlights in March 2020. So uh, that became House of UGC, I think, right after COVID hit, unfortunately. But <laughs> I'm excited to hear about what he's doing over at Full Squad Gaming. But they're interesting, Will. I know you had a chance to to chat with him as well. Um, they're really going after this casual gamer too, which you know a lot of our other esports guests that we've had have never really tried to tap into that necessarily, which I'm excited to get into. Yeah, I think a lot of people might see like, oh, gaming, um, you know, maybe I'm not into that or whatever. But I think Ben does a really good job of just knowing about social and how to tap into whatever audience you're going after. And that was the idea, right, with the check down yeah, in the NFL. Right. I mean, if you you can watch a check down, even not being a um, just being a casual NFL fan and actually enjoy that content on a daily basis. So I'm excited about that. I will tease you and I'll get right into it right when we, we uh, interview Ben. But they grew 900,000 followers in three days. I know a lot of you asked me, how do I grow followers? How do I grow organically? How do I do something that's cool? Uh, they did a pretty cool stunt that I'll let Ben break down. But how to grow 900,000 followers in three days? I would have clicked that blog link. That would be a good uh, a good one, Will. Maybe we should steal that. I don't know. All right. So uh, coming up next, Ben Gallagher, the Chief Operating Officer at Full Squad Gaming. All right, he is a chief operating officer of Full Squad Gaming. He joins us on the Business of Social podcast. Ben Gallagher is on the line with us. What's up, Ben? How are you, man? I'm doing great, David. Thank you guys so much for having me. I, I love what you guys are doing over at STN, and I'm, I'm excited to have this conversation today. Uh Awesome. I know we're recording this on a Friday. I told my producer, well, you got, you got to love a Friday pod. You know, everybody's in a good mood going into the Absolutely. weekend. It's all it's feeling all good, good, man. Everybody's yeah. feeling good. Good vibes. All right. So let's break it down because I know uh, you can speak to the listeners probably better than I can in terms of NRG, but also full squad gaming and everything you all do. So we'd love to get a sense of what you do day to day and what you oversee. Yeah, absolutely. So a little background on on full squad we're we're a pretty young startup company um we are an entertainment media company that that uh, kind of uses gaming as a lens to speak to all of popular culture um and like i said we're young we're we're about to have our uh, first anniversary uh first birthday i should say nice com coming up in december um and i'm the chief operations officer like you alluded to previously um, so I, I oversee all of our content, um, production, all operations, logistics, um, and mostly just the development of what we're trying to build into, a a young, uh, gaming empire. Um, so that's the, that's the high level view. I, I guess. love it. And then NRG sports, right? Like you had investors back what in 2015 too, with Shaq and Jennifer Lopez and stuff like that. So can you speak a little bit to like the conglomerate it is as well? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, run by an absolute genius of a man named Andy Miller. Okay. Uh, we work really closely with him. Um, and he's technically a co-founder of full squad, which is just spin out of 
um, the rest of got it from from everything else that we're doing on the NRG side, which you know NRG speaks to the competitive fan base um, a little bit more in the weeds of esports and gaming, and then Full Squad was kind of our venture into a little bit more like mainstream content um, where we're trying to just capture a little bit more audience and just the whole business model is is content. Love it. You know, it's funny, uh, you were talking, we were talking about this viral stunt uh, the last last few days that you guys did. I think you got like 900,000 followers in three days. Can you speak a little bit to that? Because I know, I mean, the number one question I get is like, how do we get more followers? How do we get it cheaper? How do we get it faster? <laughs> so you guys really hit something there that was really interesting. I would love for you to break it down. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, it's kind of, uh, we we view the, the growth hacking as kind of like yeah. uh it's a two pronged thing. Like on one side you can grow really fast. Um, and then on the other, you know, those followers with that level of acceleration, you're never sure like how much of a core fandom you're building when you're growing that quickly. And how much you can hold on to them. Right. I mean, I, I see, exactly. you know, Venmo did something recently where they gave away a hundred thousand dollars and they got a million followers, but then how do you keep that million uh, engaged so they don't unfollow? Right. Yeah, it's, it's tricky. You have to have, you have to have a really compelling hook to bring them in and then you've got to have the foundation and, uh, you have to have paved that path to keep them coming right. and just keep feeding them what they came for. Um, but, um, but yeah, the specific, um, initiative that you were talking about, we, we had pulled a stunt where we went out, um, and, bet on on the stunt to work by buying a couple printers huh. um it turns out we probably should have spent a little bit more money on the printers um because they were having all kinds of technical difficulties from from the start but we we gave a premise and obviously uh the video had a little bit more sizzle than mm-hmm. uh this explanation uh <laughs> may suggest but, all good um but we basically said that for every every person that followed us, we would print out their profile picture, uh, based on like a code that we had a friend write up, uh, that would send that URL link of their profile photo to our computer. They would send it to the printer. Um, and then that would print out that person's profile picture and we would hang it up in the, in our office. So they would like wow. be there with us pretty much. Uh, and then through just streaming that whole, um, that whole process in real time, you, you could, you could tap into our, our TikTok live and you could see, um, and this all took place on TikTok, I guess I should have said, but, um, but tapping into our TikTok live, you could see, you could potentially see a photo of your face, uh, being printed out and hung up on the wall. Uh, so I think, I think it had, I think a lot of the success we attributed to the fact that everyone felt like they could actually be a part of it like physically be a part of it. Um, and their like 2d version of themselves could actually be in the video with us. Um, and I think even in the, in the stuff that we put up on our page afterwards, like the recaps and everything, I think those were fueled a lot by people, you know, pausing and, and like screenshotting and zooming in to see if they yeah. saw themselves on the wall. It's so interesting. I mean, I think so many times you think of what's the incentive for the follower and something as simple as that, right? Where it's like, hey, we're going to print, you'll be a part of it, which seems simplistic in nature. It really gets a lot of people like going because they they have a tangible reason why they're following or why they want to be a part of it. Yeah, absolutely. And that's like inclusivity obviously has Mm -hmm. been uh, a huge part of what we're doing. And you can see that in the name is full squad. We wanted this to be like the social side of gaming. Um, It was kind of birthed at the time where um, everyone had been kind of pushed inside uh, early pandemic right. and every, everyone was, you know, no one was going out to the bar or going out to a restaurant or meeting up at the game or anything to hang out with each other. Like social life all took place in a COD lobby or playing Rocket League or squatting up in whatever game yeah. or title that you and your friends uh, revolve around. So that we tried to kind of emulate that in the early stages of our content and it still kind of reverberates in everything that we're doing now. And then I know you guys actually own the at video games handle, which is interesting because I think (laughs) some of those, some of those handles that are that easy to, to type in and, or you talk about an entire like vertical, I feel like they were squatted on back in 2009, but um, I guess 
That's interesting. Like in terms of brands thinking about going out and buying a handle like that, I guess, what have you guys seen in terms of the value of having an easy to remember handle that kind of speaks to an entire space? Yeah, I think obviously it's, um, it's, a uh, it's a plus when it comes to traffic, just yeah. organic traffic of, you know, it's not a misleading title in any capacity in our strategy. It doesn't have an underscore in it or anything like that, which is nice. <laughs> no. Yeah. And actually, yeah, actually, I, I do have a good story about that for TikTok too. Our, our TikTok handle is, has two underscores in it uh, between full squad and squad and gaming. Okay. Um, but we also locked down our, um, we, we have the f- at full squad handle, um, but we wanted to try it to go viral on our first post. Um, and we wanted to have two chances at it. Um, so we tried the the underscore account first, just assuming it might flop and luckily it didn't. So we're stuck with the underscores for now on TikTok. but yeah, the, um, nice. The Instagram account is, uh, it's definitely highly trafficked. Obviously the like new users, um, starting up a new Instagram account, uh, doesn't really compare to the amount of people just signing up for a TikTok and right. and ex- exploring that like engagement economy. Um, and so you just don't see the ripple effect of a lot of new users coming on board on Instagram. And so TikTok has been a bigger focus than Instagram, but we view our Instagram audience as a really valuable place um, in terms of engagement and just being able to tell the stories of the gaming industry as a whole. Um, from an entertainment yeah. perspective. So to give you a sense of our listeners, uh, you know, CMOs, you know, directors of marketing, uh, digital, everything, you know, Fortune 500 brands, sports entertainment. So I would love mm-hmm. to get someone like you's opinion. I get two questions all the time. It's like, and one of them is, how do we tap into the Gen Z audience? Another one is, how do we grow our following when it comes to TikTok and these different stunts that you guys, I think, have mastered? So let's start with the Gen Z audience. I mean, obviously, gaming is catered more to that younger demo, but what's something that you've learned that you think any brand can tap into when it comes to engaging that Gen Z audience? Yeah, absolutely. It's always a tricky thing. And I I came from... um sports media background as well. So I Mm -hmm. kind of understand where uh, some of those folks that are listening are coming, coming from and, and what they, what they're, what they've got on their desk today. Um, But um, I definitely think when it comes to creating original content, it's a lot about just emulating your audience and knowing what they want to see. It's like, you know, a lot of our talent on camera, they're wearing the clothes that Gen Z is wearing yeah. they yep. they're in tune with the style that they're wearing they're saying the words that that gen z says and um i mean some of our talent are gen z folks uh so that helps but um i think it's important to just emulate the whole like humanity of that um and emulate your demo or target target not market that makes sense it, yeah, yeah exactly um and you know the the obviously we've we've targeted TikTok as an important platform for us specifically because in the beginning it was highly Gen Z. I think yep. in the, in the past year or so, the, there is a healthier mix of uh, different age demographics mm-hmm. um, on the platform. And I think we've actually um, brought in a lot of like 18 to, to like 32 year old uh, young, young males specifically on our TikTok audience, but we actually, we have skewed um, pretty heavily female uh, in comparison to other gaming brands um, in audience, um, which is, which is an interesting statistic, but yeah, I think it just being very, um, being very pointed about how you uh, attract them by just kind of being more like them. Yeah. Uh, Pretty simplistic view of it. So, and I think you guys have really found a way to u- utilize content, obviously, as the the catalyst for that. You know, I think it's interesting. I think you might agree with this as well is because of COVID, right? You saw e-racing on Fox Sports. I think they pulled a 1.2 rating. Um, you know, then you see what the ESPN is doing with the Manning cast, um, if you're not aware, but it's simply like oh, a, yeah. second, a second way to Very watch the aware. game. And I think, you know, because of COVID, it's really accelerated this different way to watch, different way people want to engage. So from a content standpoint, are there any, you know, tips or tricks or things that you guys have learned that, you know, you just notice people 
are wanting to interact a different way because you see obviously Twitch having that real time chat, being able to talk with the host. I just feel like the way we absorb content, especially the younger generation is going to change uh, if yeah. it hasn't already. Most definitely. I think we're seeing content change all the time, like even even at a higher acceleration than it ever has. And I think part of the reason is everyone knows what it's like to have actually created a piece of content. Yeah, Whereas, that's a like great Instagram point. and the, like back in the day, Instagram wasn't content creation. It's like you snap a photo on your phone, which everyone was doing. Throw previous a filter to, on it and you're done. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> everyone yeah. had done that before Instagram um, and the advent of uh, filters and everything. But now like folks on TikTok, everyone knows what it's like to create a piece of content. They understand the, um, the like risk and reward of what you can and can't do on the platform. They know like, this is what you, this, what's happened. This is what happens when you post something like this, you get banned or, yeah. you know, this, this did this many views for this person. Let me, let me see, like pick out the different, um, like common denominators between but, these five. And even, if, even for the casual consumer to know how to like cut a video to a beat. I mean, that alone, if you think about it in the last 20 or 30 exactly. years, understand that, you know, everybody underneath 25 has cut a, a cool video to a beat. I mean, that's a huge difference than 1990. Yeah. Right. So. Absolutely. And the, and the algorithms are, you know, mm -hmm. I've, I think they're potentially just rumors and you guys can feel free to fact check me on this. But um, even the, the platforms are pushing folks um, in, in this direction too. Like um, I know like TikTok, um, I've heard rumors like the first post on an account gets pushed uh, quite a bit heavier than yep. the subsequent posts. And so they, they know what it's like to reward people for those views. And they know people are in this for like the potential of, you know, um, having a, like building a community that they can then use for whatever they want to do. And they, I think they understand that going quote unquote viral is addicting and you want to continually try to produce more content, try to beat that or, or get back to that dopamine rush that you yeah. got a few weeks ago. <laughs> so. Yeah. So it's, I guess my, my point that I was getting towards with that is that the pure content, I don't think is enough to build a valuable brand anymore. Yeah. Uh, it was probably three years ago. Um, you could just put stuff up and, and people would, would start to gravitate towards you. But I think now it's so much more about connection, um, which obviously that's been a part of it for a long time, but I think everyone kind of know, and like we'll see people in our comments saying like, Oh, you should have done this differently. Or like, they're giving us like <laughs> editing tips and stuff <laughs> on, on, uh, some of our posts. So, I think it's so much more about just like building actual connections with a core fan base. And that's kind of what we're focused towards. Um, yeah. Moving I, forward. Um, I was on a call with a, with a client and we had like a meme mocked up and they said, I don't know. I'm just not a big fan of this creative. It looks like an intern can make it. I'm like, you're right. An intern can make this. And <laughs> the consumer really enjoys it. They, they want to see more of this raw type of uh, creative because it, it, it resonates more. So just, you know, moving and grooving, I guess, with the consumer and what they like. You guys, one thing I haven't heard from maybe other competitors, I've had a lot of different, um, you know, esports guests on the program is I think at an NRG level, full squad gaming, you guys are really big into this casual gaming space opposed to maybe some others. So can you speak to what that is and why you guys are um, all in when it comes to making sure you can speak to that, that audience. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, of course. I think that's, that's a, a crucial thing to me. I, in my background, I, I worked with NFL media and I built up a youth engagement brand called the check down with them. Oh yeah, uh, of course. Uh, yeah. Um, then I moved over to Bleacher Report and House of Highlights. Um, and between those two brands that I was helping to build up, um, we kind of had the same thing. Obviously, our our like North Star was closer to basketball at House of Highlights and football, obviously, with the NFL. Yeah. Um, but building in popular culture and like using football as a vehicle to tell um, stories that can appeal to a wider audience than just uh, football fans, diehard football fans. Um, we started to see that that opened up a lot of doors in terms of partnerships, in terms of viewership in terms of like the general sentiment. Yeah. In and I think, you know, the check down is so much that, right. The casual NFL fan. I mean, it just, it tapped into that so well, I think. 
Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, and that was the goal from the start was um, how do we build out a new audience that hasn't been attracted mm. yet? And that was what, that was the hole that we saw in the industry. Um, although I do think there are some good companies out there um, doing similar kind of work. And um, obviously we're not the sole company um, speaking to the casual gaming fan, but I, I did think that that was uh, missing for, for what it's worth um, in, in the industry. And I think that's kind of the hole that we're trying to plug. I love that. What's something, I guess I would love to hear at, at a couple stops that you just mentioned, the NFL uh, check down, you know, obviously house of highlights and bleacher, um, what's like your favorite campaign or favorite stunt or favorite thing you learned, I guess, at each of those stops? Oh, that's a great question. Um, favorite campaign. We had a, a lot of opportunities to, to work with different personalities. And, um, actually my co-founder at full squad and I did a Super Bowl game show at, um, hmm. at the check down and where we, we gave out various prizes, um, for like uh, people proving their fandom, and we were able to like give a give away a Super Bowl ticket to this older couple because the the husband was willing to get a tattoo, um, <laughs> like right there. Um, nice. So uh, that was that was a pretty fun one. Um, but some of the some of the valuable stuff that I learned from doing those live events um, with these bigger companies was that like the boots on the ground, getting out and and showing your brands to people. Um, out in the community pays back uh, yeah. like tenfold. Um, and that is something that obviously we haven't been able to do with full squad quite yet because of COVID um, and everyone's been indoors for the last little bit. But I think that's a chapter ahead of us is figuring out how we can make more like human connection with people and, and like start hosting events um, at our space and bringing people in and, um, and building those connections with with real people in the real world uh, that also play into content really well. Well, it's funny. I actually recently went to LA and and just got some dinner and and lunches with a bunch of my clients. And to your Super Bowl story, it almost felt as if I was presenting them with Super Bowl tickets. It's been so long since they've actually been able to go out yeah. and have a meal that it was so special to them. And I think that's such a great point for marketers is in a world that has now gone to, oh, let's just do a Zoom. Why the hell would I fly? Why would I drive up? Let's just make it easy. I think the face-to-face -face communication, face-to-face -face interaction is going to become and already has a lost art. So not only like, mm -hmm. you know, human connections like you and I, but also when it comes to brands and their consumer, I do think those that are willing to invest in that, just that, are going to see such huge returns. I do think a lot of brands are going to turn that off completely and say, hey, let's save money, let's make more profit and just make it all virtual. Um, so I'm in line totally with that. Yeah, I think I think it, it, it's um, it's so much about like, you, you'll log on and you'll go to anybody's page on TikTok and, you know, our competitors and phase clan, they have 6 million yep. followers and, yep. and Dexerto has however many million followers they have. And uh, you can look at a media company here and there and you compare those, those big numbers that everyone gravitates towards. But then it really comes down to the unsung number of that you never is never going to be listed anywhere. Um, but how many people actually care about you and what you're doing? Um, and how yeah. do you build, build in that like subset of audience while also caring about those like major obvious, like view engagement, follower growth mm -hmm. KPIs, but how do you not neglect that core fan base and, and how do you get all of those folks in the same place and have discourse with them that may separate from just the general content that you're right. pushing out on a daily basis. I, I think you're so right. You can make a decent connection through your content and through an online community, but the connection goes tenfold once you uh, maybe face to face or have an event where they can interact with that community. Uh, Cause mm -hmm. I think ultimately humans want to be around humans at some point or another. Um, so I totally agree with that. This may have been a little bit past your time. Um, you know, obviously Omar started house of highlights and I know you were the director over there at bleacher, but what are your thoughts? I've been asking a lot of people this question. What are your thoughts on handles having a personality behind them? I think, 
Omar did that so well. Then ESPN goes and gets him and makes him kind of the the voice behind at Sports Center. We all know there's like 19 different people behind the scenes helping yeah. him make that content. And same with House of Highlights. But what are your thoughts when it comes to brands having a, a human or a at handle behind the tweets behind the Instagrams? Yeah. Um, first off, Omar um, is uh, obviously at the top of the mm-hmm. top of the game and and. I never question any of his tactics. He's one of the best, <laughs> if not the best at what he does. Um, and I actually, um, I need to send him something that I forgot to send him. I just also remembered. too, I've, I was saying for years, like Omar killed the sports center model. I mean, it's, it's funny that sports center went and got him, but even myself, you know, yeah. I would, I would tune in once a day to watch highlights and get caught up. But now house of highlights does all that and more. So there's no need to, to watch yeah. all linear. So it's pretty insane. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you, I think traditional sports obviously have such a legacy and such a brand yep. to them and all the leagues obviously have their legs under them for a long time and will have very uh, prestigious futures ahead of them. Mm-hmm. But I do think, like like you said, like the shift to the Manning cast and the way that people consume those sports right. um, aren't as natural to the history of those sports yes. as they, they are natural to gaming. They are natural to online competitions and challenges and personality centric um, content. And that obviously benefits us greatly. So I think um, obviously like if you use the Manning cast and some of the other developments in uh, like mainstream media and entertainment, um, if you use those as an example, you can kind of start to see why it is important to have a personality behind a social media account. It, it is important to have a human behind, uh, like you have to humanize these brands now. It's like if I, I all the time talk about like the comparison between uh, like podcasts and the news. Like if you watch the news now, after you listen to a podcast, it's so hard to, no, to it's take funny. it seriously. I was actually on a podcast recently and I said, you know, Joe Rogan has 10 times the audience that CNN does. And you see like, you know, what Joe Rogan has done and Russell Brand is doing this now. It's a conversation. It feels like, okay, this person's kind of questioning the same things I'm questioning. And I think especially this younger generation is just not resonating with, I'm David Brooklyn. This is CNN News and our top story. Like it just doesn't, yeah. it doesn't resonate, like you said, because they're used to the Twitches and the streams and more of the Manning cast style opposed to that button up approach, which I don't know yeah. if traditional media is ready for that, for that switch. Yeah. I, th- I mean, I think it'll take a long time, obviously, for companies to ad- like adapt yeah, adapt and, yeah. and switch over to the new style. But you hit it on the head. I think it's so hard to go back to the super dressed up mm-hmm. um, and, you know, bureaucratic version of entertainment after you've seen the raw and real product. And yeah. so that was even like um, I after Omar left for SportsCenter. Um, I went over there and my first, um, my first goal was to build out the team again. Cause he took so many of his guys over I to bet. sports center. Yep. Um, and so, um, and you see them now, like Caroline, who has kind of taken my spot over there since yep. I left to start full squad has done a really good job. Um, Chuck, Deshaun, Aaron, um, all the folks over there on that team have become uh, personalities and now they're going out to games and like they're kind of doing the same angle of coverage as, as Omar does. Obviously, it has its own brand to it. Um, but yeah. I think you're starting to see these bigger accounts realize like uh, and something that we've realized, too, is like we went out and we got like 10 different TikTok personalities at the beginning of Full Squad and we we were paying them. A different we had them on different contracts um but they were basically getting a cash for content exchange yep. and so they would make a short form v- video for us and that would be the content mm-hmm. exactly but then we go back to it and we're like all right we're, we're getting four videos a month and we're paying this fixed cost for it um and it's really hard to build up like a core fan base that care about these personalities when it's so infrequent yep. um and so, yep. so we were like all right let's, let's be in these videos. Let's make time every week to be in these videos. And like, let's not, let's not put ourselves on a pedestal. Let's not put this like quote unquote talent role on a pedestal um, and make it more than it is. Like we view ourselves as replaceable in the content and we let the idea speak for itself. So whoever we our our thought is whoever's in the video should be able 
to be replaced well, by somebody else because the idea is so good. And I think if you look at content overall, like I think what Howard Stern did was so smart where he brought in his entire staff, right? You're talking to the producer, the board operator, the newswoman. Um, you you heard from everybody. Everybody had a microphone. Everybody was a personality, kind of like a reality show. And people, you know, Barstool has done the same thing. I think people resonate with more of that approach rather than what we just talked about, right? Like it's one person. You have to act like nobody else is in the room. It's all you. Um, I just think it's, mm-hmm. a, it's a more natural approach. I had a question for you. How? Uh, House of Highlights, uh, I guess, towards the end of your time there, how many humans does it take to power, uh, you know, twenty four seven sports? I'm just curious. Yeah, full full transparency. I signed on. Um, I left NFL Media to replace Omar when he moved over, um, and Caroline, who I mentioned earlier, was running the account on her own. Wow. Um, and so I, I remember like the heaviest days of NBA season, we would have like nearly 15, 20 Instagram uh, pieces of content rolling out every day. We'd have an Instagram story. Yep. Um, we have like eight to 10 posts on TikTok every day. <laughs> um, some of that's original content that uh, we had an original content arm of, of the of the content team that would work on those and deliver those to uh, the teams that I oversaw on the programming side. Um, And those would go out, but yeah, on, on any given day between YouTube and TikTok and Instagram, which were our main, um, our, and and Snapchat as well, we had minutes and minutes and um, posts and posts of content that needed to go out um, without flaws. And so, I signed on and then COVID hit. Yeah, I saw on LinkedIn, you literally signed on March 2020. So that hit you like a ton of Yeah, And then Rudy's up there touching the mics. um, And then it (laughs) comes out that he had COVID and the NBA shuts down a couple of days later. Um, And so I was was getting excited for March Madness. Everything shut down. Mm. So it's me and uh, Caroline, who was already kind of knew the drill. So I'm I'm getting my feet wet at House of Highlights, and it was two people running probably what should have been a ten-person wow. team for qu- quite a while. We were on a higher. And you, you guys turned into House of uh, House of UGC there. I mean, you had to you had to post yeah. up then. It worked exactly. well. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that that's a testament too of like, um, I think like the biggest sports brands, even Sports Center. You look at their account, like so much of what they're doing is is just like regurgitated yep. TikToks. Yep. Um, from people in you know, the sticks out in Alabama shooting on their farm hoop or whatever. Um, people, I think people uh, frown at it sometimes, but being an aggregator of content is extremely important and very good business if you look at <laughs> the history of media. So uh, I think it's, it's smart how they've done it. So I wanted to um, kind of wrap with just some rapid fire questions. Any um, brands or accounts or creators that you think any marketer should follow uh, just to get some ideas, inspiration, anybody you're following on your side? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's so, <laughs> there's so many awesome, um, awesome creators on TikTok, especially now. Um, and you've seen like a while back, we had the, uh, the uh, Eureka moment of a TikTok is the single most valuable piece of content. If you could only pay for one piece of content, um, to be created, it would be a TikTok because that can be populated on pretty much every platform because yeah. every platform has a TikTok competitor now. Yeah. So if if I'm making a TikTok, I could I could view it through the lens of yeah. Oh yeah, I'm making an Instagram reel. Yeah. Or um, but yeah, uh, YouTube I, or YouTube short. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, and and yeah, we're we're kind of positioning ourselves to to be more on the short form side for now maybe getting into long form, but in terms of short form creators, which is the space that I've been in for the last year, yeah, I think um, there's a guy named Frank Michael Smith who makes sports stories. Um, and that resonates with me really well. I think he's built an awesome uh, look and feel and, and brand um, as just a single person. Um, and now he's, you know, you know, he's playing basketball against flight um, or he's with the two hype guys. I've seen him do some cool collabs um, and he's built up an awesome, Awesome follower base. Um, 1.3 million. I, I just followed him. So thanks for the. Uh, he's the great. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's a guy, Ross Creations. I don't know if you've seen him. Mm-hmm. I think he actually got arrested recently. He's pretty wild. <laughs> um, but he he has some of that like most genuinely funny um, YouTube videos. 
Um, and if you scroll through his his channel, you'll laugh just at the titles of his of his content. Yeah, I, <laughs> I was watching one recently that was like filling my car with or filling my gas tank with like macaroni and then hiring a repairman. So that guy is yeah. just genuinely a, a good a good laugh. Um, I think Dexerto in our industry does a really good job from a news perspective. Um, and like on TikTok, I think Washington Post was first to do it. They had one of their guys just be like the face of the face of their brand. Yeah. Uh, yep. and, and do that like news uh, media storytelling mm. kind of content. And they do a good job of that on TikTok and elsewhere. Yeah, Ross Crace is, I remember watching some more. He he calls a repairman over, says there's like rats in his ceiling, and then a human being falls through the <laughs> falls through the ceiling. So yeah, funny yeah. stuff there. Um yeah. I guess what's one thing that just translates across the NFL, bleacher, full squad gaming, something you learn, something that you do every time you get to a new stop, um, that that just stays true to being a marketer, being a content creator, all the all those things. Ah oh, man. <clears throat> I know like the I, and you would expect this, but at the bigger, bigger corporations, bigger businesses that have social as uh, as a main department that they're focusing on, yeah. um, it is like way too common for folks to feel like they they know the drill and they they they're the best in the business. And I'm probably guilty of that at times. But the more that I've jumped around from football to basketball. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and with house of highlights being youth culture as well, uh, was how we kind of defined it, but that UGC arm and now to gaming, um, and, I just on the side and, um, in terms of like consulting and talking with other folks in social, I've, um, kind of learned more about like the cosmetic space, the, yeah. uh, the, just like influencer model and how those folks make a living on social media. Um, the like beauty space, my girlfriend works, um, in quite a bit and, um, comedy as well. So my friends are in that space. I think there's so many pockets of social and there are so many different tactics that work specifically for those audiences Good point. Um, yeah. that can be applied elsewhere, whether it's formats for mm -hmm. content where it's packaging, um, or just distribution strategy, you name it. Um, I think people are, can be closed minded about what's out there and they think they, they know the drill, um, for pretty much any industry when there's so much to learn from, from all different avenues of, of social media. So I think it's, it's just valuable to kind of get outside of that. And it speaks to, you know, gaming as a lens for all of popular culture. Yeah. Like how can, how can we, like, I, I would rather bring in, for, for full squad, I would rather bring in somebody that barely knows anything about video games, but maybe grew up playing Madden huh. and is a generally interesting character in the mainstream culture and have them, yeah. you know, out of their comfort zone for a piece of content. I would rather do that than potentially like somebody who's like a dominant esports yep. guy who's going to put up the craziest gameplay you've ever seen. Yep. Uh, so, um, that was a bit of a rant, but um, I guess the main point is um, there's so much to open your mind to. And as TikTok explodes and YouTube starts to get into short form and this whole industry shifts towards more volume output, yep. I think a lot of that stuff is really important to understand. I love that. What's a, a blog, newsletter, maybe a Twitter follow that you um, get your information from and just like stay, stay up on the ever-changing industry? Ooh, in gaming, Jake Lucky okay. is uh, is the man to follow. Um, and like I said, I think Dexerto does a really good job. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing their name correctly. Um, <laughs> okay. Dexerto. Um, yeah. But they do a phenomenal job. Um, and uh, outside of that, I don't religiously, I'm, I'm probably guilty of not religiously going to, I don't have tweet notifications on for a right. lot of different places. I. I still have Hoop Central is a great basketball account. I get a lot of news from there. Pat McAfee is an awesome yes. personality in sports. Yep. Um, and everybody knows him. Yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, overall, I I'm we've got all the software and everything. So I'm looking at pretty much this the stuff that gets the most views and impressions of the day. It. But, but um, 
but yeah, uh, always looking for that next person. Do you have anybody that you've been? That well, you've no, had I, uh, it's funny you say that about, I've never really turned on tweet notifications unless it's NBA trade deadline. I got Wojnowski, you know, uh, <laughs> I want to sure. see those Woj bombs, but yeah, I find myself too following a bunch of different people and just, you know, maybe doom scrolling at, uh, at times and, and looking at all that stuff. So, um, yeah. True. So yeah, to, to wrap, I'd love to just get your final thoughts on uh, any advice. I mean, you've had some pretty awesome stops again, NFL, um, Bleacher, now going into this venture with Full Squad Gaming. Um, any advice for someone trying to, uh, you know, parallel path your journey and, and, and see these different stops and, and, and be where you're at one day? Yeah, I think um, social media is obviously a really, it's a people people um centric place to be like you got to be good with people and you got to know how to communicate with people Mm -hmm. um and so a lot of a lot of just the like behind the scenes business of it is is, i think building up a network of folks and not in like the annoying linkedin way of building up a network i think it's really just like find somebody that you that you would turn on twitter notifications for find somebody that that's out there like actually making interesting stuff and you know, maybe, maybe get a 15 minute call with them or, or learn where they're coming from. Uh, just naturally, uh, I'm, I'm typically just really curious about why people are building a brand, like what they're going towards. And, uh, it's been really cool with full squad. We've worked with so many different and super talented creators, um, and just kind of getting their opinion on it uh, has been super refreshing. Um, I, you know, coming from the background of working with bigger corporations and, and most folks who are just like behind the camera, behind the keyboard, um, running strategy for brands that have legacies. It's, it's been awesome to see people on the ground level uh, with that same level of passion, just building a brand for themselves and kind of figuring it out day by day. And so I think so much of it is, is right there at your fingertips. If you want to do anything yeah. in social media, like uh, Grady, my co-founder always says like, uh, if somebody has a crazy idea, to do something and we're like torn on whether or not it'll perform well or um, if it'll hit the right sentiment or how people will respond to it. We're like, Oh, well, it's probably already out there somewhere. Like there's so there's millions of, of minutes of content going up Mm -hmm. all the time. And so there's so, so much out there if you just look for it. And um, I think a lot of this job is research. So we spend a ton of time just finding people looking for the best content, finding the different trip uh, tricks of the trade, um, different tips that we can find for people. And I think if anyone wants to accomplish anything in social media, it's, it's probably already out there and there's probably already a path um, that's kind of drawn out for you, but, um, but you, then you can kind of apply your own flavor and uh, personality to however you want to go about it. I love it, man. Well, thanks so much for dropping the knowledge on the fine folks and uh, everything you, uh, you gave us today. We appreciate it. Yeah, man, this has been awesome. I'm All glad right. I got a chance to talk with you guys. You as well. All right, man, we'll talk soon, man. All right, sounds good, Take David. Care. Thank you, guys. All right. Peace. All right, thanks so much to Ben for joining us on the program. Uh, really good get there, Will. Again, I think he had so much expertise across, you know, NFL, Bleacher, House of Highlights, and then going into the eSports space. But – we haven't really talked a lot about this with any guests. I mean, we talked about the Manning cast, of course, and and just the, the difference, I guess, in terms of what's resonating. And I know, uh, Will, you probably remember hearing me talk about on the podcast I was interviewed on, where people are just resonating more with the Joe Rogans and the Russell Brands and the PT, um, sorry, the, the, the Barstool Sports, if you will, as far as that type of medium opposed to the traditional media. And I think they're going to have to switch up how they present sport live sports how they present live news because this newer generation is probably not going to put up with that yeah and i think that's something that ben and his team really really understand given his background just like it doesn't have to be the most like you the cnn example you use like yeah it can be casual it can be relaxed and that's how you find you know a more of a following and people who are eventually going to get more into your brand Man, what do you say if he can only do one thing he would uh work on a tiktok because of how much that can yeah, he posted on so many other platforms. So I know I've been, you know, we keep on saying this. Would you, God, would you start a TikTok already? Like this is important stuff. But yeah, it's interesting to see someone that has had so much success at those different stops, and he's so much in that Gen Z esports new age environment that he's telling all marketers like, "Yo, if I only had 
one time and one piece of content. I'm going short form. It's going to be on TikTok. Then I'm pus- posting that on IG Reels, YouTube Shorts, because so many people will in our industry ask us, how I only have limited resources. How do I get the most bang for my buck? How do I get the most ROI? And that's a great takeaway right there from Ben. He also answered that very quickly. Like, yep, yeah, I'd make a TikTok. Yep. I do this. I do that. And uh, I'm trying to this find way. the uh, whatever exact date it was. But I think over a year ago, you had an episode and the title was literally just, it's time to make your TikTok account. I know, I know. I know. And, and some people still aren't listening. Yeah, I, know, I need to get on that. Ah! All right, so that was uh, episode number seventy six. Thanks, thanks so much again. Uh, November seventh, twenty nineteen. Oh when wow! You said that. Thank you. You're I welcome. mean, guys, if you're listening right now, and uh, go back into your boss's office, put together that deck, and be like, "This is why this is important," because you're going to wish you did. Um, it's November fifth. Uh, this is like this is like so the Bitcoin. I remember. Two, I mean, two years you were ahead of that. I remember in two thousand sixteen seventeen, I had friends. Bitcoin, Bitcoin was at seventy five hundred dollars a coin. And they said, you got to get on this. You got to buy a couple coins. And back then, I wasn't really investing. But boy, oh boy, did I wish I bought a couple <laughs> coins, uh, as we all did, right? So I think TikTok is the, I guess, the Bitcoin equivalent of it. You, it's still early. You still have a little bit of time. Don't feel too bad on yourself. But um, this is where you're going to be able to amass a huge audience where everybody else is really mature at this point. All right. So thanks again to Ben. Thanks to the folks over at Full Squad Gaming. Of course, uh, I mean, did did, did Furker help on this podcast or not? Should I thank him? Yes. I, okay. So we'll thank Furker. I mean, thank him anyway. I mean, that's just the right thing to do. Of course, uh, producer Will, it's been yet another edition of the Business of Social Podcast. My name is David Brickley. It's all been powered by the GOAT, STN Digital.